So I think it's uh, six oh one now. So I think we should uh, start. So I'll first introduce uh, uh, Innovation Forum. Then uh, we will uh, have the speakers uh, give their talks. So hello everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, the Cambridge Innovation Forum webinar series. Uh, my name is Izu, and I am the head of uh, Innovation Forum Cambridge. Um, today we'll be talking about antimicrobial resistance. So feel free to type your question if you have one uh, in the chat, but please be sp specific to whom your question is directed. Okay. Um, so Innovation Forum uh, is, is a grassroots of um, multiple uh, innovators across uh, the globe. Uh, here at the Innovation Forum, we drive uh, innovation uh, and technology development by connecting innovators, the industry, and investors. We aim to improve human health and well being by translating cutting edge science into innovative products and services. Um, one of the events that we organize um, almost every year is called Imaginif. Uh, it's a global competition and it's an accelerator program for science-based uh, ventures. So if you want to learn more about uh, the Imagine If competition, I would really love to uh, invite you to our next webinar uh, that is uh, about the innovation, uh, the Imagine If competition. Uh, the next webinar is on the 29th of July, 2020 uh, at 5 p.m. Here is the... Um, uh, the 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 flyer for that uh, event. Um, before we start, I would I would just like to thank our uh, funder, uh, the uh, Microbiology uh, Society, who really helped us organize this event. So, without further delay, uh, Isabel, can you please introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Arjuman? Sure. Thanks, Yusuf. Um, firstly, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sylvia Argyman, uh, a genomic epidemiologist at the Sanger Institute in Cambridge. Sylvia's research involves the analysis of pathogen genome sequences regarding antimicrobial resistance, uh, assisting the development of pathogen surveillance in a public health context. And I'll hand over to Sylvia now. Thank you, Isabel, um, and thank you for the invitation. I just want to make sure that uh, people can hear me well. Yes, we can yes, hear you. Yes, we can. Okay, um, so I'll start sharing my screen. And I'll go into presentation mode. Hopefully this works. Um, okay, uh, so I can see my presentation now. I hope everyone um, is also able to see it. Can you confirm, Isabel? Yes, we can see it. Excellent. All right, so um, today I'm, I'm going to talk mainly about genomics for surveillance of antimicrobial resistance. Um, but since I'm the first speaker, I've also prepared a few introductory slides to uh, hopefully give an overview of the problem. Um, so um, we know that antimicrobial resistance or AMR for short is on the rise. Um, this, what we call um, antimicrobial resistance is the ability of a pathogen, so a disease causing microbe, to survive treatment with a drug that was once considered effective. And um, this is not a new problem, but we have now gotten to a point where we have high levels of uh, resistance found in all regions of the world. Um, and this has both an impact on public health and the economy. So on the infographic on the right, people can see that, hopefully, that it, it is estimated that uh, yearly about 700,000 people die around the world uh, due to uh, resi drug resistant infections. But this number is estimated to rise to about 10 million um, by 2050, five zero, if no action is taken. 
Um, and on the other side, we have the problem of the impact on the economy. And uh, the World Bank has estimated that by 2050, the global GDP could um, drop between 1 and 3% due to the impact of uh, AMR. And um, it is especially important that it is uh, predicted to increase the economic inequality between low and high income countries. And it's, you know, AMR affects economically, uh, particularly low income countries. So it may come to no one's surprise that it, this is a largely man-made problem, at least the severity of it. Um, so uh, the main reason, though there are multiple, is the misuse and overuse of antimicrobials in humans, animals, and plants. So for example, for crops. And also uh, an increase in burden of infectious diseases in animals and humans in general, due to um, various factors such as poor sanitation. Um, and on the side of the pathogen, actually, because you know, the pathogen also has a, a big contribution to this problem. Um, the, 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 the microbes that cause disease in humans and in animals are capable of growing very quickly and replicating very quickly in a way that they can acquire um, resistance by genetic mutation. Um, and they can also borrow resistance from environmental microbes. And then these uh, um, resistance determinants can jump around different pathogen populations. So on the chart on the left, um, I know the, the font is, is quite small, but you have two timelines that are linked by a horizontal-ish line or a diagonal line. And um, on the left, you have the year that a specific antibiotic was developed. And on the right, you can see the year that the target pathogen developed resistance to that antibiotic. So you can see that this happens um, relatively quickly. And the problem is magnified by the fact that the development of new antimicrobials is slow and driven by market decisions. So um, in the last 30 years, there have been no major new types, new classes of antibiotics. Um, so we are in desperate need for new discovery platforms and novel therapeutics. Um, so in 2015, the World Health Organization um, um, released a global action plan to combat AMR that sits on five objectives. Um, these are improving awareness and understanding of AMR, strengthening the knowledge and evidence base through surveillance and research, reducing the incidence of infection, optimizing the use of antimicrobials in human and animal health, and developing the economic case for uh, sustainable investment. Um, so, you know, to assess the impact of AMR, which is what the World Bank did. So um, there are several of these areas in which um, genomics can contribute. Um, and I'm, I'm marking them with this uh, DNA uh, icon. Um, and uh, today I'm going to focus mainly on the second column, the surveillance uh, aspect of it. So when we're talking about genomics for surveillance of AMR in a nutshell, so I've just ex explained the process very briefly, um, we usually find ourselves with a collection of isolates that have been taken from different patients, which is what you see on the left. Um, and these isolates have one or more uh, resistance phenotypes, so they are resistance to different types of antibiotics. And so we sequence them um, with, we sequence the entire genome sequence, so the entire um, genome of these pathogens. And then with bioinformatics pipelines, we analyze the DNA sequences and um, draw relationships between them based on the genetic similarity that are represented as networks or trees, um, which is what you see on the left of the screen. So then on, with the, with the genome sequences, we can also identify the presence of specific genetic mechanisms that are known to confer resistance. 
And we tend to uh, map those onto the tree, which are those little blocks that you see, to assess the distribution across these different lineages or groups that we identify on the tree. Um, and we can also map um, other types of genes, so, such as virulence genes, and any clinical and um, epidemiological data that we may have gathered from the patients to try to find patterns in the data that will inform us about the emergence and spread of AMR at very different geographical scales. This same process can be done within a hospital or within a region or within a country or globally. So in the Center for Genomic Pathogen Surveillance, which is directed by David Annensen and is split between the Welcome Genome Campus uh, in Hingston and the Big Data Institute in Oxford. We um, do global surveillance of pathogens using whole genome sequencing to understand the emergence and spread of AMR and also to provide actionable data. So data on, that can be used to make informed decisions about um, how to tackle this problem. And there are, you know, it's a, it's a group that has it with different people with different expertise. So we take different approaches to this issue. And today I'd like to focus, uh, um, or I'd like to talk on, on the implementation of genomic surveillance in LMICs. Uh, like I mentioned before, uh, low and middle income countries are very affected by this problem, uh, both from the public health perspective and from the economic perspective. Um, but also uh, surveillance and AMR is a global problem. So when resistance emerges in one part of the world, it um, ultimately spreads around and affects all of us everywhere. So it is important that it's not just studied in high income countries, but as a global problem. So um, our first project um, that uh, aimed to integrate whole genome sequencing into um, an existing network of AMR surveillance was done in collaboration with um, the ARSP or Antimicrobial Resistance Surveillance Program in the Philippines. And it started in 2016. And uh, in the figure you can see on the left, um, uh, little, little dots around the map of the Philippines. Um, this network, um, this surveillance program is a network of sentinel sites or hospitals that take samples from patients throughout the country and then they refer them to a central reference laboratory where they get confirmed and, and tested for their resistance and they are stored in a central database as an isolate with a specific resistance profile or AMR profile. And every year, the ARSP summarizes all the data that it gathers from about 25 Sentinel sites um, and reports um, the yearly resistance rates uh, for specific bug drug combinations and then compares them, compares them to those rates in years past to um, detect trends where, you know, what is going up, what is going down. And then they use that information um, and they re return it to different stakeholders. And for example, they, um, they use it, the Department of Health uses that information to make uh, decisions about the policy of antibiotic use in the Philippines. Um, so, we work together with them to um, make whole genome sequencing a part of their workflow so that now they can um, sequence these isolates collected by the Sentinel sites and then identify um, high-risk clones based on the genetic relatedness, the genetic relationships between isolates and the presence of specific uh, resistance mechanisms. And um, sometimes also um, they can detect which um, vehicles are shuttling these resistance mechanisms around different lineages. So um, one of the key aspects of this project though was that while we were working on a large genomic survey of eight different bacterial pathogens that was done at the Sanger Institute in uh, Hingston, we were also working together to transfer this technology to them. So um, 
we um, help them set up a sequencer in, in, in their uh, institute and also train the staff both in laboratory and by informatics methods so that they uh, eventually we get to a point where the, the ownership of this technology is transferred to them. Um, so in a paper that was uh, came out last month, we um, exemplified some of the findings from this project and um, at the local level we found uh, a previously unreported outbreak of a uh, Klebsiella pneumonia lineage that was resistant to carbapenems. Uh, these are, this is an important antibiotic for the treatment of um, very serious infections. And this was uh, an outbreak happening in the neonatal ICU, the neonatal intensive care unit of one of the hospitals. So this was at the local level. Um, at the national level, we found also within the same pathogen, Klebsiella pneumonia, that there was a prevalent uh, clone, but using whole genome sequencing, we could dissect it into uh, sublineages and, and actually see that there were regional patterns of spread of these high-risk clones between groups of hospitals. And then at the global level, we found a high-risk clone of E. coli, um, a specific lineage called sequence type 410. It's just a label, really that was carrying two um, genes uh, that also confer resistance to carbapenems. One of them was um, sort of um, coming out from, coming in from international sources. It's, it's widespread throughout the world. And the other one was being acquired locally, we could see by uh, using whole genome sequencing. So based on, um, the uh, success of this first project, we um, secured funding to uh, continue the work with the Philippines, but also to expand with, to other uh, countries. And we are now collaborating with also with um, India, Nigeria, and Colombia to set up whole genome sequencing in uh, refer reference labs in these countries. And, um, I'm happy to report that in 2019, um, this team in the Philippines investigated their first outbreak using whole genome sequencing um, with their local capacity. And the same happened in Colombia this year in 2020. They investigated an outbreak in a hospital, um, sequencing locally and investigating locally. Um, so in the few minutes I have left, I'd like to mention another approach that we take at the center, uh, which is the provision of tools um, for genomic surveillance of AMR. Uh, so as you can imagine, um, transferring the ownership of this technology to um, a new place takes a, a great deal of, of time and training, and it doesn't happen in a very short Span. So in the meantime, it is important that um, there is access to tools that facilitate working with genomic data, um, especially in public health settings where um, not everyone has uh, um, training in bioinformatics. So uh, one of the tools that we developed in the center is called Pathogen Watch. It's a web application. And so instead of working on a, on a Linux terminal, you can work with a browser, a web browser. And it's focused on genomic surveillance of different pathogens, but with a focus on, a, on AMR. And it's free and easy to use and accessible to people with all levels of bioinformatics expertise. Um, so we've developed analysis workflows for a few different pathogens. And um, today I'd like to demo one of them if this works. It's the first time I do this um, on a Zoom webinar. So I will switch now to my web browser. Um, yeah, so this is the web uh, pathogen watch uh, application. And um, there's information here about the different pathogens that, um, that you can anal analyze with it. Um, but because we don't have a lot of time, I'll just go directly to the upload page. 
And I have here um, 10, 10 different genomes. So if I open one of them, you can see these files are just a very long string of DNA. And then um, there's a metadata file that has information about each one of these isolates. So for example, these ones have, um, it, this is all um, um, hypothetical, it's not real metadata, but you know the, the collection date, the country where they were collected, and the latitude and longitude. So I will select all these files, and then I just drag and drop them to the web browser. And now they're being uploaded via my Wi-Fi um, and sent to a server where they will get analyzed. So they are uploaded in batches of, um, of five. So it will take a, a few minutes. And as soon as they start to get uploaded, they start to get analyzed. So if you are uploading a large amount, like 500 genomes, you don't have to wait for all 500 to be uploaded to start to get analyzed. So I'm starting to see some results here on these rings, um, which are telling me characteristics about these particular um, genomes that are belong to a pathogen called Salmonella enterica cirovartaifi that causes enteric fever, uh, especially in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and in Asia. So now they have all been uploaded, and um, these are the analyses that have been run so far. So I can view my genome. The first thing I get is this list um, with some information. Some of it is information that I uploaded. This is information that uh, Pathogen Watch uh, computed. So I can select them all and then uh, create a collection with them. I'll just call that demo. And now I see, because I provided country and latitude and longitude, I can see them on a map. Um, these are two locations within Bangladesh. And now Pathogen Watch is computing a tree to show me the relationships between my isolates, which I can see now. So these are interactive views. If I select one of them on the timeline, it shows me on the map and on the tree. If I select a cluster on the tree, I can see where uh, and when they've been isolated. I have to zoom out a bit. Um, and importantly, there are different functions and information that we can get. But um, since we're interested in resistance, Pathogen Watch predicts the presence of genes and, and mutations linked to resistance. And I can display them both on the map and on the tree to um, study the, this data set of interest. All right, so I think I am now um, out of time. So I would uh, like to finish by um, acknowledging everyone in the team. Um, so like I said, um, this, is a, this is a collaboration between um, people with different expertise. We have software developers, data scientists, um, biologists, so um, I would like to just acknowledge all of them. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sylvia. And um, now we're moving on to Dr. Andrew Edwards, who is a molecular microbiologist at Imperial College London. Um, Andrew's research is based on ascertaining the molecular bio basis of treating uh, refractory infections and developing therapeutic solutions to overcome antibiotic resistance and tolerance. Um, and I'll hand over to Andrew now. Thank you, Isabel. And I'd like to thank you and, and the rest of the team for giving me this opportunity to um, share some of the work that we've been doing. Uh, if I can find my slides, here we go. Can you, uh, can you see that okay? Yes, it's brilliant. Great, thank you. So uh, I think Sylvia has really uh, set the scene very well. And um, one of the solutions um, amongst many uh, to, to the AMR crisis is uh, the development of new antibacterials. So I'm gonna talk a little bit first about some of the challenges associated with developing new therapeutics. And, and, and Sylvia touched on some of these, so I'll keep it brief. And then delve into a little bit of 
of some of the, the various approaches that we're taking in my lab to try and try and develop these new drugs. So um, first of all, uh, Sylvia mentioned the carbapenemase producing Enterobacteriaceae, and these are rated by the World Health Organization as one of the, the critical threats. Um, these are data from England, and um, what you can see um, is a time series and essentially the number of cases over time. And what I'd like you to take away from this is that as recently as 2009, these weren't a huge issue in England, but very rapidly there's been an expansion, uh, an increase in, in the number of cases. And without going into huge amounts of detail, this isn't just one type of organism. These are many different bacteria expressing many different types of carbapenemases. And these are enzymes that can degrade many of our frontline penicillin type antibiotics. And, you know, I think this underscores the point that perhaps Sylvia was, was really trying to make is that maybe in 2009, if we had been more aware of this and, and saw the trajectory of this increase in cases, um, we could have reorientated our, our approach somewhat. But in the context of, of drug development, where we're looking at lead times of 10 to, to 15 years, you know, it would have been very difficult to make a case that we should have been tackling these types of infections 10 years ago. Um, so being able to sort of look into the crystal ball a bit and, and try and imagine what the future will bring is going to be absolutely critical to meeting whatever is the next challenge in, in 10 years time. So um, again, uh, we saw a similar slide earlier indicating that there have been very few new antibiotics developed in recent times. Almost all of the antibiotics in use today were developed between 1940 and, and the 1980s. Um, so part of the problem, in a sense, was that antibiotic discovery was so successful that there was a period where there were almost too many different types of antibiotics. Um, and resistance during this period wasn't really a huge period, uh, a, a huge problem, although Fleming had actually predicted resistance would be, one day become a, a, a big problem. So because the market was saturated with antibiotics, a lot of pharmaceutical companies withdrew from, withdrew from, from their efforts to, to, to detect and, and develop more antibiotics. Um, and that means not only that there haven't been new uh, antibiotics entering the pipeline, it also means that a lot of the expertise and experience in developing antibiotics uh, sort of died off and, and, and we're left now with a situation where we have to try and um, redevelop that capacity. Now, the other uh, challenge that faces um, people who want to develop antibiotics is that the financial returns are minuscule. Um, you will, I'm sure, have seen multiple uh, reports in, um, in the news of, of various uh, pharmaceutical companies either withdrawing from their antibiotic R&D programs or of smaller and medium-sized companies going bust. Despite the fact that they've developed some quite good antibiotics, um, there just isn't the financial returns. And the reason for this is, if we think about most new treatments, if you think about a treatment for cancer or depression or diabetes, the only real limiter there is production and, and, and how much uh, a country can afford to, to use that therapy. So, you know, in a lot of rich countries, certainly, there is a huge demand for new drugs and the volume uh, of usage is huge. And so sales are, are very strong. By contrast with antibiotics, um, what we're trying to do actually is restrict their usage um, to, to try and preserve their efficacy. So they're used only with the very most drug resistant infections. And that means that there's a very limited volume of sales. So the financial returns on developing new antibiotics are, are tiny. And if we look um, here at a comparison between uh, immuno-oncology drugs and antibiotics, the, the difference is stark. So you can see there's more than 1,500 uh, clinical trials involving immuno-oncology drugs, just 42 for antibiotics. Now, all of these data come from a really, really uh, first-class uh, overview of the challenges of antibiotic discovery, uh, recently reported uh, on the Wellcome Trust website. And if you have any interest in antibiotics, resistance, or drug development, I would strongly encourage you to to visit that page uh, and read their report. Now, Sylvia showed a, a variation on, on this figure, um, just to make the point that um, over time, we've had a lot of antibiotics developed, mostly in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 
Um, but resistance has emerged to all of them, and it typically emerges very soon after the uh, drug is introduced into clinical use. So, you know, we have a challenge of a moving target, and we have to uh, predict 10 or 15 years into the future. We have uh, a very dire economic situation in terms of, of developing new drugs. And we also face uh, a foe that is extremely nimble and able to uh, acquire resistance really quite readily. Now, in terms of, of how we, we go about tackling this problem, there are a range of different approaches. And I'm just going to mention a, a few of these. So, so one that you've probably heard of is bacteriophages. And, and these are viruses that infect bacteria uh, and, and kill them. There are what's known as antivirulence approaches. So rather than trying to kill bacteria, what these do is, is stop bacteria producing um, the mechanisms by which they cause infection. And it's thought that this would provide less of a selective pressure for the resistance, uh, for the emergence of resistance. There's also a growing interest in monoclonal antibodies and, and, and these have been used um, to pretty good effect in some autoimmune conditions of cancer, but they can also be used to neutralize bacterial toxin production or, or, or opsonize or tag bacteria for destruction by the host immune system. And there's also growing interest in antimicrobial peptides. So um, we all produce antimicrobial peptides as part of our normal host immune defense, um, and these can be adapted to make them more effective in killing uh, bacterial pathogens. So that's all I'm going to say about those. We don't take uh, any of those uh, approaches. Um, we do something a bit different. And what we try to do in my lab is to try and harness the positive, the benefits of our existing antibiotics, which for the most part are very cheap, they're effective, they have established safety profiles, and we, we know quite a lot about them. And generally our approach is to try and increase their lifespan and, um, and essentially work with what we've got. So I'm going to give you very briefly, three um, approaches that we've investigated in the lab. One is combination therapy, which was uh, cropped up in one of the questions earlier. Another is chemical adaptation of existing antibiotics uh, to um, target them a little more effectively. And then finally, a broader approach that we think might be useful for making lots of different antibiotics work better. So, Although we always have an eye on the translational potential of our work, fundamentally, we like to understand the basics. And we think that by doing that, we can identify new opportunities for therapeutics. So I showed you this graph earlier. Uh, these are uh, the, the situation with um, carbapenemase producing bacteria. These are highly drug resistant um, and are very much, as you can see, a growing threat. Now, infections caused by these organisms are often treated by an antibiotic called colistin. And this has become something of a, a drug of last resort. Now, it's not the last resort because it's the best. In fact, it's a pretty ropey antibiotic. It's quite toxic um, and it doesn't work super well, but it really is in some cases the last resort. The problem is that for many years, colistin has been used in animal feed and resistance has emerged and, and disseminated on, on plasmids uh, around the world. So the threat of colistin resistance is a, a growing problem. Now, colistin um, is an antibiotic that targets the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria. So essentially, there are two types of bacteria. Gram-positive have a single membrane, and then gram-negative bacteria have a double membrane um, with what's known as lipopolysaccharide on the outer layer. And that's important because that double membrane makes it very difficult for antibiotics to get inside the cell and kill them. So we wanted to understand a bit more about uh, colistin resistance. And so uh, Maddie and, and Akshay uh, took a bunch of clinical E. coli strains, um, most of which were colistin resistant, you can see the red and green, and three control strains which were susceptible. And they did a very simple experiment. They exposed these bacteria to colistin. And when they measured survival, what you can see is that the susceptible strains were killed by the antibiotic. The resistant strains, there was either very low levels of killing, or but the vast majority of them actually actually grew. So that's exactly what we'd expect. These are bacteria that can resist colistin. But then Maddie went on to understand a little bit about whether colistin could still target the outer membrane uh, of the bacteria. And to our surprise, she found that it could. So I'm not going to go into the details, but on the right here, we have a graph 
which is essentially a measure of outer membrane permeability. And you can see that for all of these strains, in the absence of colistin, there's not really much permeability. But even though these bacteria are resistant, colistin still causes outer membrane permeability in the majority of strains. Now this was uh, really unexpected and interesting because when we think about the outer membrane, as I was saying, the outer membrane is a barrier to a lot of antibiotics. So if we think about an antibiotic like rifampicin, which is pretty old and cheap and uh, often used to treat, for example, tuberculosis, rifampicin is very good at getting across one membrane, but it's no good at getting across two. But now we've just found a way of permeabilizing that outer membrane. So can we use colistin to allow rifampicin to enter the cell? And I think you probably guessed from the tone of my voice that yes, indeed we can. So this is a measure of the concentration of rifampicin needed to stop growth of our E. coli strains. And you can see that rifampicin on its own needs about 16 micrograms per mil, which is a dose that's not really achievable clinically. But when we add colistin, you can see that the amount of rifampicin needed to inhibit growth of the cell is much, much lower, well within the range that we could achieve in patients. So what this fundamental research indicated was that we could take bacteria that were resistant to rifampicin and to colistin, but that would become sensitive to the combination of the two drugs. So I think what this shows is that it's quite hard to predict which drugs will work synergistically based on their susceptibility to individual drugs. So moving on to a second example, one of the downsides of antibiotic usage is that antibiotics don't just target the bacteria causing the infection, they also uh, damage the, the friendly bacteria, the good bacteria that live in our guts. And so we wanted to explore whether we could do something about this. So as we've mentioned earlier, resistance is a big problem in a lot of major pathogens. And in terms of E. coli causing urinary tract infections, about 50% of those strains are resistant to beta-lactam antibiotics such as penicillin. And they're resistant because they produce enzymes, beta-lactamases, that degrade those antibiotics. <coughs> so beta-lactam antibiotics have this characteristic structure here in red, and the beta-lactamase beta antibiotics cleave this bond. And this causes really quite profound changes to the chemical structure that means the antibiotic no longer works. So what we wanted to do was try and study whether we could use this to our advantage. Can we turn the resistance against the bacterium? And so I'm just going to talk you through our strategy. So this is some work uh, led by Lindsay Evans uh, in the lab sponsored by the Wellcome Trust. <clears throat> and she spent a lot of time uh, in the chemistry lab producing a beta-lactam moiety that was cleaved by beta-lactamase enzymes, but didn't have any antibiotic properties. And she used that moiety to block the activity of a second antibiotic. So this whole molecule is completely inactive against bacteria. So if you imagine our patient with a urinary tract infection, there are beta-lactamase expressing bacteria in the bladder, and then we have the, the rest of the bacteria, the friendly bacteria in the gut, and we don't want to damage those. And, and most of those, almost all of those, will not be expressing beta-lactamase. So we apply our, our new molecule, and this is um, inactive, so it doesn't cause any harm to uh, the microbiota. But when it encounters the beta-lactamase-producing bacteria, the beta-lactamase cleaves this bond here, some electrons shuffle along these bonds and that releases the active antibacterial component, <clears throat> and thereby hopefully killing the bacteria in the bladder, but not disrupting the gut. So just to share some data that provides proof of concept, if we look at the blue lines, if we take our, our pro-drug molecule and we expose bacteria without beta-lactamase, you can see that they grow. They grow as well as bacteria not exposed to an antibiotic. 
But when we exposed E. coli expressing beta-lactamase to the prodrug, we saw killing. And this was at the same level as the active antimicrobial on its own. So this has provided us with confidence that this approach might work. And we're currently uh, trying to figure out how best to, to proceed with the work. We're not the only uh, group to have thought of this. Uh, there are other examples. This is a, a, an example here of how a, a similar approach could be used to combat mycobacterium tuberculosis. So the final example I'd like to talk to you about um, is work led by uh, Becky Clark and, and Campo Ha, a PhD student in the lab and sponsored uh, by Shinogi and, and the Medical Research Council. And Antibiotics, um, there are lots of different classes of antibiotics and they tend to target discrete um, metabolic processes in bacteria. <coughs> Excuse me. So they might target cell wall biosynthesis, protein synthesis, RNA biosynthesis, uh, and so on. But what's interesting and what's been observed for a while now is that each of these discrete uh, perturbations results in a general uh, disruption of metabolic activity in bacteria. And this uh, has a number of uh, effects, including causing DNA damage in bacteria. So the data here come from studies with two different strains of Staph aureus, and this JE2 is a particularly nasty MRSA strain. And you can see that these four different types of antibiotics all cause DNA damage uh, in the bacteria. And this is a readout of the bacterial response um, where it's initiated a DNA repair response. And you can see that this is a dose response uh, going on here. Now the, the degree of damage varies between antibiotics, but all of these antibiotics cause DNA damage in both of these strains. And so we thought, well, you know, if we could disrupt the ability of the bacteria to repair this damage, we would help the antibiotics kill the bacteria better. So what we did was to essentially take a, a bunch of mutants lacking various uh, components of DNA repair, and we measured survival over time of exposure of these strains to various antibiotics. Uh, and this particular antibiotic is cotramoxazole. Um, and what you can see in blue is the wild type strain, the normal bacteria. And, and when this is exposed to antibiotic, you can see that it survives pretty much at 100%. So although DNA damage is occurring in this bacterium, it's able to repair that damage really quite efficiently. When we disrupt what's known as the REX-AB DNA repair component, you can see that the bacteria can't repair the damage and the vast majority of them die off quite quickly. We saw similar results for lots of other uh, classes of antibiotics, beta-lactams uh, and, and so on. And what's interesting with this approach is that we found that inhibition of that REX-AB DNA repair component also sensitized staph to host immunity. So these are data from a, a mouse systemic infection. What we have here are the number of bacteria present in that mouse. We have our two strains of staph here, the wild type, the normal bacteria, and the mutant. And you can see that in both cases, there are significantly fewer bacteria surviving um, when this REX-AB repair complex uh, is absent. So we have a, a single DNA repair uh, complex that allows staph to withstand both antibiotics and also the host immune system. So we thought, well, if we can, if we can inhibit this complex, we might have a really nice therapeutic that would you know, promote the activity of lots of different antibiotics and the host immune system. And so we teamed up with um, Ed Tate and his group in the Department of Chemistry, and we published um, our first paper last year, where we describe um, a small molecule inhibitor of DNA repair. Uh, and this actually made a, a class of antibiotics called the quinolones work better. It didn't just make them work better, it reversed resistance, reversed quinolone resistance in our MRSA strain. So we're working with the chemists now, um, to, to optimize the molecule, to characterize it, and to begin that long, slow process towards trying to make something that might one day be clinically um, valuable. 
So hopefully that gives you a very uh, brief um, but broad overview of the types of approaches that, that we're taking to develop new therapeutics. And I just want to make three uh, points before I finish. <coughs> the first is that we do need uh, new drugs now and also in the future. So we have to predict the future threats and act accordingly. Um, but there are many uh, impediments to doing this. I'd like to make the point that there's way more to tackling AMR than the new drugs. Um, we need much uh, faster diagnostics. Um, as uh, I think Sylvia made the case very strongly, we, we need surveillance. We need to know what's going on and, and what's coming our way. We need to increase our fundamental understanding. Um, we need better policies, particularly at the global level. Um, there is, of course, a focus on uh, misuse and overuse of antibiotics, but of course, in some parts of the world, it's a lack of access to antibiotics that's a problem. It would be nice to have vaccines, and, and of course, as we've touched on uh, in the questions to Sylvia's talk, uh, sanitation is an important issue. And just finally, from a, a personal perspective, um, I talked about some work um, with the chemists. Um, we're also doing some work with, with bioengineering to develop drug delivery systems. Interdisciplinary working is challenging and you do run the risk of embarrassing yourself by forgetting your A-level chemistry, but it opens up huge possibilities and I would encourage all of you to um, branch out where possible, work with people outside of your discipline and um, it, you know, it, it, it really has been uh, fantastically rewarding. So with that, I'm just going to thank uh, all of the people who actually did the work, uh, the collaborators, the funders, and uh, thank you all for listening. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Andrew. That was very interesting, very entertaining. And finally, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Nicole Wheeler. Um, she is a data scientist um, at the Centre of Genomic Pathogen Surveillance at the Wellcome Sanger Institute in Cambridge. Uh, her research focuses on developing computational methods to understand adaptation in bacterial pathogens and flagging high-risk strains. And I'll hand over to Nicole now. Hi everybody, I'm Nicole Wheeler and I work as a data scientist at the Centre for Genomic Pathogen Surveillance. This evening I'll be talking a bit about how we can use machine learning to predict antimicrobial resistance using bacterial genomic data. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about potential use cases for this type of work, um, how we go about building these models, and also how we go about testing their performance. Uh, so for a bit of context, both genomics and machine learning are increasingly being considered as potential tools in the fight against antimicrobial resistance. Um, in the case of genomics, uh, whole genome sequencing or metagenomic sequencing are increasingly being considered as potential replacements for antimicrobial susceptibility testing, uh, partly because the cost of genome sequencing has been decreasing over time. Um, also, the portability of the technologies that we use to do this sequencing has been improving, um, and the time it takes to produce genomic sequencing data can be shorter than the time it takes to um, characterize the resistance of an isolate to a panel of antibiotics in the laboratory. Once we have a whole genome sequence uh, from that single test, we can then gain a lot of insights about that particular isolate. Uh, for instance, for a lot of bug drug combinations, we already um, have the ability to predict antimicrobial resistance quite accurately. Um, and as we continue to gather larger genomic and laboratory data sets uh, and analyze them with statistical and machine learning approaches, uh, we are improving our ability to link genotype to phenotype and accurately predict resistance to a larger panel of antibiotics. In addition to that, uh, we can also scan those genomes for known virulence determinants, and we can also look at the relatedness of a sample to other known virulence strains. Uh, and we can also look at our single genome sequence in the context of other genome sequences that we have collected in the past to investigate whether an outbreak might be occurring or to look at how a pathogen or antimicrobial resistance is being transmitted um, between people, between animals and the environment. 
um, at a hospital scale or a national scale or a global scale. Machine learning is being increasingly employed to analyze genomic data. Um, so the bar plot in this slide shows you the number of papers that mention both machine learning and bacterial genomics um, from the year 2000 to the early 2020s. You can see that really in the last few years, we've suddenly seen quite a big uptick in the number of papers addressing this subject. There are a few reasons for that. Um, one is that they, these machine learning approaches are really built for analyzing big data. Uh, they allow really efficient analysis of a lot of genome sequences at once. Uh, in addition to that, um, the computing power that we can use to analyze these large data sets has been improving over time. The efficiency of the software that runs these machine learning algorithms has also been improving. Uh, and I think really importantly, the accessibility of the software and the usability by beginners has really improved over time. Um, and the ability to run quite sophisticated analyses on simple computer setups like a laptop or a desktop uh, has really improved, allowing more people to get involved in this kind of research. On top of that, machine learning methods um, can be really explicitly geared towards producing accurate predictions. Uh, in the past, in genomics, we've done a lot of association testing that's looked at the link between individual genetic elements and antimicrobial resistance, uh, which has done a lot for our understanding of the biology of resistance, um, but doesn't really tell us how to look at a whole genome sequence and all of the genetic elements within that holistically in order to assess um, the likelihood of resistance in a specific element. So machine learning really allows us to look at the broader picture of what's going on across the whole genome uh, and make specific predictions about specific isolates. Uh, and importantly, it also allows us to consider the potential interactions between different genetic elements in determining resistance. Also, the way these algorithms behave can be tuned according to the relative cost of a false negative versus a false positive. Um, and these costs can be different depending on the specific application that you're thinking of. So the types of applications we're considering for this type of work is um, potentially clinical diagnostics that might inform a doctor about the best antibiotic choice for a specific infection, um, taking into account the genomics of the bacteria causing the infection, but also possibly uh, the host microbiome and their underlying demographic factors that might uh, relate to their risk of carrying a resistant infection. Um, also looking more broadly at surveillance of um, how rates of resistance are changing over time, but also where resistance is and what the hotspots are. Um, and also in terms of um, taking that data and making forecasts into the future uh, in terms of how we expect antimicrobial resistance rates to change over time. I'm linked with this, um, using this modeling to assess what might Um, here we are setting up genomic surveillance of AMR in middle and low income countries, looking at collecting a large amount of genomic data and susceptibility data. Um, so here we might look at the value of um, using machine learning to infer antimicrobial resistance where we don't have laboratory data, um, or looking at what we can learn from data collected from middle and low income countries um, that we didn't know just by looking at data collected from high income countries. Uh, in addition, uh, Outbreak is a project that's starting in Australia uh, that aims to collect genomic data from humans, animals and the environment uh, with the purpose of um, identifying where in each of those res reservoirs um, hotspots of AMR are currently 
um, looking at how the genetic determinants of AMR um, move and spread between those different locations, uh, and also forecasting into the future what major AMR threats uh, may be on the horizon, and designing interventions to eliminate them. Um, I'll talk a bit about how we build these models now. Uh, the first step is gathering data um, for building a model. Uh, and at the moment, most models in this space use publicly available data. Uh, there's a huge amount of genomic data that is publicly available for anybody to analyze. Uh, but the major challenge in building these machine learning algorithms is associating that data with appropriate labels um, telling us information about the samples that we might want to know, such as antimicrobial resistance status. Um, of the data that are available, ideally what we would like to do is pull all of it into one big data set uh, to build the best model possible. Uh, but unfortunately, labels um, telling us about antimicrobial resistance across different data sets may not be um, very comparable. For instance, um, different laboratory tests have different sources of error that we need to take into account. And also, um, if data are labelled according to sensitivity or resistance to an antibiotic, uh, the breakpoint that's been used to make that designation um, and the time at which that decision is made can really influence um, which isolates are labelled as resistant and which are labelled as sensitive. Once we have the genomic data, um, we need to process it into a form that can be accepted by a machine learning algorithm and used for learning. Uh, what this often involves is taking either raw read data or whole genome sequences um, and breaking those down into shorter fragments called k-mers or words. Um, and then looking at the patterns of presence and absence of those different words um, across a collection of bacteria. Uh, this approach uh, can be very effective at breaking down quite complex data into something that can be easily processed, uh, but it produces very large data sets with a lot of redundant information. So one active area of research at the moment is how you can then take those fragments uh, and reconstruct them into larger pieces of DNA without losing any important information. Once we have our data sets, uh, it's now time to train a model. Um, at this stage, what we want from our data is um, a data frame that has all of our samples that we're learning from, the different variables that we're interested in, and some sort of numeric variable linking those two as well as labels that we want to train our machine learning algorithm on. Um, there are a lot of different machine learning algorithms that you can choose from, uh, which all take slightly different approaches to learning from the data. And it can be very hard to anticipate ahead of time um, what the most effective approach is going to be for a specific problem. So usually what we do is we pick a selection of methods uh, we train them all on our data, and then we assess their performance to decide which is the best. Um, a really important part of testing a machine learning algorithm is understanding how it performs on new data. Um, so one of the things that I've been looking at is um, taking algorithms that have been published in the scientific literature um, and assessing their performance on data that the original model has never seen before. Um, so in the table, we have an example of an algorithm that was trained uh, using clinical isolates collected in Texas over the course of about four years. Uh, when the original paper was published, its performance was assessed uh, using a really common technique called cross-validation, where um, of the entire collection of bacteria, most of the data were used for training, and then a random subset were held out to test the performance of the algorithm. Um, and in the left-hand column of numbers, you can see the reported performance of that algorithm according to that testing scheme. Uh, so for a lot of antibiotics, uh, this is using Klebsiella pneumoniae genomes, uh, the accuracy of this algorithm is very good. Um, but when I tested the same algorithm on clinical isolates collected from hospitals across Europe, um, we can see the accuracy figures on the right. Uh, so for some antibiotics, the performance was similarly high on this new data, which is very exciting. Uh, but for other antibiotics, we can see that the performance is a lot lower than we expected. 
And this suggests that whatever this algorithm has learned about resistance from that Texan collection um, doesn't really capture the full picture and doesn't generalize well to another continent. Um, so in order to uh, better identify situations in which this might happen, before these algorithms are published and used on other data, uh, one thing that I have designed is a, um, an alternative testing scheme where we actually take advantage of the genetic relatedness of bacteria um, to cluster them into different families. And then we partition those families into training and testing data. And what this does is it asks whether what the algorithm has learned about resistance in some families of bacteria um, applies equally well to a brand new family. So this is going to give us a better assessment of how the algorithm might perform um, on new lineages that emerge in the future or in lineages from other countries that it's never seen before. And that's compared to the old testing approach, which randomly um, separates data out into training and testing. When we compare these different testing approaches, uh, we can st sometimes see very big differences in the performance of our algorithms. Um, so here, a traditional uh, method of performance appraisal is shown in the purple dots. The y-axis here is a measure of accuracy. Um, and you can see that the model looks very accurate across different subsets of the data. Um, but in the green dots, we can see this altered um, assessment of accuracy which reveals that actually in some bacterial families, this algorithm performs very well, um, but on others it performs quite poorly, suggesting there is more about the biology of resistance that this algorithm needs to learn. Another thing that we can do to assess the trustworthiness of these algorithms um, is by interpreting what they've learned and what they're using to make decisions. Uh, so in this case, we have an algorithm uh, which predicts azithromycin resistance in Neisseria gonorrhea. Um, and we're able to pull out the major features in that algorithm that are driving decision-making. And you can see there's one that sort of dominates the others. When you map this back to a Neisseria gonorrhea genome, you can see that it's actually flagging a key mutation in the 23S ribosomal RNA, uh, which has the largest effect on azithromycin resistance that we know of, uh, and is relatively common among gonorrhea. Um, so this gives us added confidence that if we use this algorithm in the real world, um, it's learned something about the biology of resistance and it's likely to continue to perform quite well. Um, so to summarise, machine learning does show a lot of promise for predicting clinically important information from bacteria or genome sequences. Um, but we have to be very careful in this area to make sure that the algorithms haven't overfit or memorised uh, their original training data. And we have to make sure that um, these algorithms perform in a fair way, meaning that for any given patient demographic group, um, including patients from overseas, uh, the performance of the algorithm doesn't drastically change. More work can be done in this area in terms of developing methods for correcting for the relatedness of bacterial isolates while an algorithm is being built, uh, and also when we're assessing its performance. Um, and also in building more internationally balanced data sets. So at the moment, most of the data for, the, for training these algorithms comes from the UK, the US and Europe. Uh, and a lot of middle and low income countries are poorly represented or not represented at all. And finally, um, most of the machine learning algorithms in this area are being published in the academic literature as proofs of concept. Um, it's not common to perform a prospective or a retrospective clinical trial to assess the performance of these algorithms in the real world. Um, and that seems to be the next step in really determining the readiness of these models um, for a clinical setting. These are my contact details in case you would like to get in touch and learn more. Um, I would like to thank the organisers for inviting me to speak tonight uh, and to thank everyone who's watching. Thank you. And thank you to Nicole for that um, for that talk. Um, my apologies that uh, the sound cut out part through. Uh, before before we stop, uh, I just want to thank again the uh, Microbiology Society uh, for helping us. Uh, the Microbiology Society is a membership uh, charity for scientists uh, inter interested in microbes, uh, their effects, and as well as uh, their practical uses. 
It's one of the largest uh, microbiology societies in Europe and has a worldwide uh, membership in universities, industry hospitals, research inst institutes, and uh, other institutions. Uh, so um, I just wanted to mention that uh, our next webinar is on the Imagine If competition. Uh, if you'd like to attend, it's on the 29th of July, 2020. So um, I think we will end here. And thanks again uh, to our speakers because I, I found it incredibly uh, interesting. So uh, thank you everyone for attending our talk and see you guys next time.